How'd you like to listen to .NET Rocks with no ads? Easy. Become a patron. For just $5 a month, you get access to a private RSS feed where all the shows have no ads. $20 a month will get you that and a special .NET Rocks patron mug. Sign up now at patreon.netrocks.com. Hey, Carl and Richard here with your 2024 NDC schedule. We'll be at as many NDC conferences as possible this year, and you should consider attending no matter what. The Copenhagen Developers Festival happens August 26th through the 30th. Tickets at cphdevfest.com. NDC Porto is happening October 14th through the 18th. Tickets at ndcporto.com. We'll see you there, we hope. Hey, guess what? It's .NET Rocks, number 1914. Mm-hmm. So it's almost the beginning of World War One. That's it. Yeah, that's where we are. <laughs> I'm going to be doing this for a while. Just wait till you see the comment today, friend. You'll, you'll laugh. Oh, that's going to be good. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, I'm Carl Franklin. That's Richard Campbell. Howdy. And uh, we're going to be talking to Ulrich Malmgren in a few minutes. Mm-hmm. But first, let's do that thing we love. With a doo doo doots music. Yep. Better know a framework. All right, man. What do you got? So, uh, our friend Simon Crop sent me this. It's not his repo, mm-hmm. it's uh, Tyler Brinks, and the name of it is SQL Parser CS. It's an extensible SQL lexer and parser for .NET. Interesting. Yeah. It was ported from a Rust project. Right. You, you parse SQL statements into an abstract syntax tree, and there you go. And now you can, you know, query your way around it. Interesting. Isn't that cool? Why do I want this? What's wrong with T-SQL? Well, some of us aren't T-SQL gods, such as okay. yourself, Richard. I don't uh, know that I'm a god of anything. Oh, uh, you knows. know, I think you are. Mm, but... Okay, just another way to get at the data. Yep. I love it. And, uh, you know, that's it. Uh, and if you need it, you need it. That's what I think. That's fair. I buy, I buy that. Yeah. So who's talking to us today, Richard? Well, you know, I know we're talking about mob programming, right? Yeah. And we've talked about mob programming before, so I figured I'd go back. And Woody's just cool. out of coincidence. But, and by the way, Woody's still doing his thing. He's doing, still doing workshops. He's out there. Yeah. But by coincidence, the last time we talked about mob programming was in 2013 on episode... 912. Oh my gosh. Now we we published 1912 today when we're recording this. Yeah. On August 22nd. So literally a thousand episodes ago. Wow. We did something weird. We actually talked to an entire mob, which included Woody Zool. Right. Uh about mob programming. Yeah. And actually we had a ton of comments on that show. So I figured I'd drag out a 10 year old's comment. I mean, what's the big deal? Really? It's it's a very American thing, right? It's <laughs> like, oh, you like pair programming? How about mob programming? Yeah. How it's about like, the only hey, we know what would be better? More. More. Let's is do more. better. <laughs> <laughs> so 10 years ago, Richard Garside wrote this comedy. He says, I'm wondering how far you can scale a mob. When does it stop making sense to recruit new people for one mob? And what point do you start multi mobs? See, see, <laughs> that's exactly my point. More. <laughs> More, a more mob mobs. not enough for you. More mobs, <laughs> make more mobs. You know, I think we're going to take that. Got to take that question over to Ulrika. Yeah, uh, at some point. So, Richard, uh, thank you so much for your comment. I hope you still hear this ten years on, or at least you'll get the email prompt and so forth. A copy of Music Code by is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music Code by, write a comment on the website at dotnetrocks.com or on the Facebooks. We publish every show there. And if you comment there and I read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music Code by. Music to Code by still going strong after all these years. Yeah. And uh, still a favorite way for people to get into the zone when Mm -hmm. writing code. Works for me. And uh, you can follow us on X Twitter because we've been there for years before it was X, of course. Many, many years before it was X. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the cool kids are hanging out on Mastodon. I'm at Carl Franklin at techhub.social. And I'm Rich Campbell at mastodon.social. So send us a toot. That's another way that you could get a copy of Music to Code by. For sure. Okay, let me introduce our guest. Ulrika Malmgren has been in the software industry in some form for 20 years or so, as of this recording anyway. She started out as a software tester using exploratory testing to study and learn about software and users. 
After realizing that quality was more than just testing, she worked as an agile coach to help teams improve their ways of working. But for the past eight years, she's been a C-sharp developer working mostly with back-end applications. The last six of those years have been using mob programming, as said forth in the comment, or software teaming, uh, as it's also called, as a way of working. So, Rilke, welcome to .NET Rocks. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I was really excited to see that you had this talk at NDC Oslo, and I'd meant to do the interview there in person, but things happen, so now we're doing a little bit later from there, because we haven't talked about mob programming in ages. But clearly, it's still going on. Woody's still doing his thing. Like, there's plural site videos on the topic. How do you explain mob programming or let's say team programming? Uh, I would explain it as the entire team is working together. So we're programming together. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked how you said like pair programming on steroids or uh, even mm -hmm. more pair programming. Uh, but also um, not just the programming part of it. Uh, so the entire team is working together, but maybe also answering emails uh, preparing PowerPoint presentations, right. uh, yeah. all of the other stuff that you do when you're doing software development. I was going to say, the last time we talked to Woody about this, everybody was in a room and one person was driving Visual Studio or whatever the you know software is, and everybody else is sort of chiming in. And now in the age of Zoom and remote, that must be quite a bit different, isn't it? It is, but it works really well. Mm. Um so we do that, uh, actually. My team is uh, fully remote, uh, so I get to spend a lot of time with my cat, um, mm -hmm. and that's good. But what we do <laughs> is we have a, uh, a computer at the office, uh, and we're using AnyDesk to remote to that computer. Yeah. And we have a, a Slack call or a team call or something ongoing, mm -hmm. um, and we talk, and we do all of our communication and programming on that computer. So I don't have the source code on my laptop, actually. I only mm -hmm. use my laptop to connect to this computer and to do personal uh, work things, like things that are just for me. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I find that a fairly common practice, putting my run as hat on, where sort of data integrity points of view or keeping all the source code in the, in the company means you're just logging into a virtual machine or a remote instance somewhere, and that's where all the code lives. Yeah. And the home machines don't actually have, don't ever run the code. They just have access to it through a console. Uh, and, and that solves the problem that, you know, you don't have to synchronize. Like you're all working in one place and you still have that mob programming mindset of there's one active keyboard on the code. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. How many monitors do you have? Uh, I have the one. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a big one? That's the downside of it because we only have one monitor in the office. So we, that's the one we have uh, yeah. connected to. Yeah. I mean, and I certainly remember that from some of, of the other conversations we had in this space where often somebody in the mob is on another machine and they're searching for code samples and other cases of addressing this particular problem. Like yeah. many, in some cases, totally short, short circuit the development process. Like, wait, this has been done. Here's an example. And it's starting to look like what we're already doing. Like, let's go dig into this. Exactly. You can, while you're troubleshooting, you can mm -hmm. have multiple threads of, of Googling going on at the same time. So you can right. be on Stack Overflow, a couple of people <laughs> trying to yeah. find what could be a possible solution for this uh, at the same time, if you want to. Yeah. So I knew um, Woody told us about the metrics being, you know, productivity wise, being very, very good. Um, are there any new numbers or any numbers that you can share with us in terms of, you know, single developer at a time in a team working? versus pair programming versus mob programming? Uh, I'm not aware of any. Uh, and uh, in our teams, we've only done this. We don't have any mm -hmm. numbers to, to compare mm. to. Yeah. Um, but I feel that there are so many situations where we are, uh, that this uh, software team on mob programming is just helping us so much that I, uh, I would have to say that the numbers would have to be good towards uh, mob programming. I'm thinking of all the, during the summer now, uh, because of vacations, I was sometimes alone at work. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was sitting there and it took me a while to figure out why I was doing this stupid mistake, mm. uh, which would have been something that my my team would have pointed out immediately. They would have seen immediately that I was doing something so, stupid. So this is an interesting dynamic here. Now, what if you have 
I don't know, let's say you have a team of 30 and 10 of those uh, team members are working on this part of the app and 10 are working on another part of the app and 10 are working on it. Does everybody work on the same thing all at the same time? So like there's no such thing as a merge conflict or how does that work? Yeah, I, I'm not very good at branches because I've never used them. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, well, there you but go. We don't you do just the said sizes, it. though. Uh, so we have uh, teams of, uh, for now, two to five people. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we don't have that kind of a size of a team. And that's addressing, addressing the listener, Richard uh, Garside's comment. Like, how big is what can a mob really be? Five seems like a reasonable number where everybody can still be engaged. Yeah, I would say. Three is really good. Uh, mm-hmm. And then, yeah, the engagement thing is a thing because if you were doing it, so one way of doing mob programming is using a timer and having people rotate at the keyboard. So you'd say every 10 minutes we change driver. Uh, we right. change the person who's sitting at the keyboard who is actually typing the code. Um, but all of the time you get to have input on what is being done. Uh, but yeah. sometimes you want to rotate. And uh, if you are five people, you get... Uh, 10 minutes at the keyboard and then you have to wait 40 minutes until once an hour yeah, yeah. Uh, and for some people if typing is what you like in programming right i mean i yeah. i gotta think there's some natural typers and some yeah. natural searchers yeah. and some natural reviewers too exactly so we have we have tried those kind of rotation patterns but we've also sometimes gone away from them and have a, had a more natural uh uh, kind of cycle of mm-hmm. uh, some people like to type more, some people like to go go uh, think more. Yeah. So to get back to what I was saying before, though, about multiple team sections working on different sections of the code, what if there's somebody on the team that you know when you go down a rabbit hole of a particular thing that they're not even working on, do do they contribute as well? Do you have to take time to explain what the other people have done? to those who haven't done it yet? I mean, is there, is that a problem? That's actually a sort of a, an excellent point towards uh, mob programming in the fact that when you are in, in the mob and you're working on a thing, you get to see the rabbit holes. <laughs> so you get see to everything. see like, okay, we went down this path and we found a dead end. Hmm. Uh, this wasn't actually the way to solve this problem. Uh, and you're learning those things as well because if you're just doing like a... Um, a pull request and you're sort of explaining this is what I did uh, you you rarely explain the other paths the paths that you didn't take the things that were dead ends sure you get to learn the thinking that add up to to the actual solution but I can also see how you know if you've got parallel sections of the team working on different aspects of the application all at the same time are they three times as productive as the whole team working on one of those at a time mm. like some people may think that yeah i think you want to have very um like your own domain or your own application and not have to share that with someone else i think that's also a key to getting making okay. it work all right so breaking down the teams into into sections that are working on a particular thing yeah They're all working on that thing yeah yeah that makes sense and and the point being that just like we saw with pair program, when there's two pairs of eyes on something, mm-hmm. you tend to make fewer mistakes. Like that code yeah. tends to be very checkable and and sticks around. There's less iterating on it. The th- I like the third pair of eyes because they do the other thing. You know, you like you definitely need two pairs of eyes on the code at any given moment, so that as soon as that third one's introduced, that's the one that could be searching. Yeah, you know, or it, thinking. It, yeah, and yeah. And, and, pulling new information into the equation or reading, even just reading the, the smacks in more detail and saying, do we actually understand this? Right. Like, yeah, it's like, it's kind of like a continuity person on a movie set, isn't it? Somebody who's got a 60,000 foot view of everything and says, Oh no. in that last shot, the coffee mug was half full. You got to fill it up again. Mm. Um, it also lo- sometimes looks a bit um, back when when we were in the office and doing this. It looked a bit weird to the others because we were sitting and discussing a lot. Uh, right. Yeah. And we were talking and talking, and then finally we reached consensus about what is it we're actually solving. How do we want to go about this? What's the solution mm. we can all stand behind? Um, and then when we finally reached that consensus, uh, just r- typing out the code wasn't really something that took us very long. It was the easy part. Yeah. Because mm. you had consensus. And I, th- I got to think, if you've got four people agreeing on a path yeah. and they're really agreeing, like there's not a lot of bullying going on, mm. the quality of that's going to be pretty high. Yeah. 
It is. And also you get, but you have to sort of learn to sort of, this is something I, I really want to stand up for. Right. Uh, I'm just, I'm not, we're doing tabs and not spaces. I'm going to die on that hill. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. And then you need to figure out what are the things that I'm willing to let go of and that I'm willing to, to let, to slip. Uh, because I think, uh, you can't win every battle. You, you can't have four people having absolute consensus on everything. So no, you have sure. to be a bit of a, uh, you can't be too opinionated about everything. Yeah, you you can't fight to the death on everything. Right? No. Like, mm. and, and nobody's going to want to work with you eventually. Like, it's yeah. just, you know, there's got to be some, this is not that important to me. It seems more important to you. Let's try it. Because uh, let's face it, none of this is permanent. You could go back and revise. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's better to just get to a path where it's like, I don't see a problem with that. I don't know that I do it that way, but I don't see a problem. Well, let's go and see what we get. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's that, that's the compelling part of this is that the the biggest thing you get away from with pair programming I notice is the uh, those death spirals just trapped in uh, I can't get this out the door I'm just smashing my head on the keyboard mm-hmm. and another pair of eyes and ultimately another pair of hands just breaks that up and you're always rubber ducking yeah exactly mm-hmm. and also you're learning like if when you're if I I'm not very good at CSS for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my colleagues are better than me. So if I were to solve this feature my own, uh, my CSS that I would produce would be at a certain level, which is not very good. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we're doing this together, we always get like the best person's mm. level of, of, um, of knowledge, right? which is also really interesting. And I'm learning at the same time. Do you switch keyboards at that point? Like, does the CSS, when you hit to the point where it's like, well, we need a little CSS here, it's like, all right, over to you. I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the other way around, though. Uh, maybe I'll take that because I'm not so good. Uh, right, and you so let you can be the to one to learn, yeah, and let them coach you through exactly some better CSS, hmm. yeah, and sharing that knowledge. I need to get this through my fingers to to get yeah. the mechanics of it. And that's an interesting it. angle on this, and it also speaks to I don't want three of the same person on here on this yeah. project. I, I want an array of skills. I'm trying to think of the pushback, right? If if you have a team of five and you go to your manager and say, "Hey, instead of everybody working on stuff and branching and merging and all that stuff, why don't we work together?" Um, the you know the pushback might be is I, I think, well, you have to prove that the productivity exceeds what you can do individually yeah. and and the quality, productivity and quality, they go hand in hand. Yeah, and people always say that, and it's really interesting because has this sort of working individually, has that really proven itself to be yeah. good productivity and good quality? Mm. Right. Like, did we always, we were doing software perfectly on time, bug free. Right. And yeah. then some people came along and say, can we work together? And everything went downhill uh, from there. Just do more unit tests. You'll be yeah. fine. <laughs> but it, I mean, like, I, I think I want to play with the math on it. So if we got four people mm. in a four week sprint, mm-hmm. each takes a task. All right. At the end of four weeks, you're supposed to deliver four tasks. Now flip that on his head and four people work on each task a week each all four of them work on it once, are you going to get a better result? Can they deliver those four features one a week collaboratively? And then, uh, I mean, I I think it's hard to deny that you'll get better quality code for having more eyes on it. That's always true. Definitely. So the quality question is not there. The productivity uh, question is. The question is, can you get those four features built in that sprint? Like that would be my argument to the team lead. It's like, hey, our goal is to deliver these four things in the sprint. How we do it, don't ask. You know, you can't, you don't have the benefit of parallel universes. You can't say, all right, <laughs> we'll but do it both is, ways and see what happens at the end. You also need to remember that there's so much more to program, to software development than just the programming part. It's there's the like part, reading yeah. the code. There's understanding the code. There's understanding what, why are we doing this in the first place? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's so many other things that you're doing. And I think that if you've been a part of, of all of the code production up until now, you're, you're rarely going to be in a position where you're sitting there and you're not understanding what a, what a certain piece of code is doing because you were there when it was created. So the part when it is, okay, I'm reading code, it's taking me a long time to understand what previous the, the previous programmer was doing. That part 
is gone because you were there for that part. Yeah. Well, you have a potential for new kinds of nastiness, don't you? Like when people don't agree and they're, they're resistant to doing it the right way. Mm. Has it ever come to fisticuffs? <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen more <laughs> passive aggressiveness in oh, other yeah, teams there you go. where you're sort of like, oh, oh I'm going to change sure. this. Yeah. Uh, now that's my turn to work on this feature. I'm going to change it to what I think is better. Go back right. and edit the code right in front of them. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not pretty. Yeah. Well, Dave did this and introduced a bug because he wasn't smart enough to think that this and that. So I'll just fix it right now. <laughs> But also my, my most, uh, the argument that I like the most about when you talk about productivity is the one thing that you hear in every retrospective is we have to be better at knowledge sharing. Like that's yeah. always the thing that comes up. And, and then so you have share all the time. Yeah. And then you have right. people say like, okay, so we should have knowledge sharing sessions. And then that doesn't happen. Or right. we should, we should be better at talking to each other. And then that doesn't happen. Right. But we yeah. don't have to solve that problem. Because we're mm. we're organically knowledge sharing all the time. Yeah, we don't I have to him. think about is this an important thing that we need to tell someone else about. Also, really good if one person leaves the team. Yeah, I, yeah, that's yeah. brilliant. You've always got more pairs of eyes on the code. You've got them routinely teaching each other. You're not doing a separate teaching exercise, right? Mm. Like the fact that the skilled CSS person who's in the mob walked you through writing better CSS as opposed to doing like a lunch and learn on CSS yeah. or just simply getting all the CSS work from the whole team all the time so that that person gets better and better, but never yeah. really teaches anyone else. Like there's a whole bunch of things solved at the same time with this approach and only mm -hmm. a small part of it is writing the code. Exactly. I think we should use a different term than in the mob. <laughs> I so thought I want to flip this conversation around. Like, mm -hmm. can I'm, I'm thinking? I when I started to submit talks about this topic, I wanted to contrast it to the other way of working, the thing that we were doing before. Right. And it turns out I felt like I needed to find a name for it because I, I we have mob programming. That's not a particularly good name, but we talk about a software teaming maybe sometimes, which mm -hmm. is slightly better, but mm -hmm. it's still it's still a name for something. How do you like ensemble programming? Uh, That's very, very, very French, erudite. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's just the word erudite. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like it, yeah, but yeah. Group programming, perhaps. Group programming, yeah. But That's what's benign. the other thing then? What's the thing that most people solo are doing? Solo programming. Yeah? Mm. Yeah. It's solo. And I, 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 I like that one, and I think I like even better uh one that we came up with in the group which was uh individual centered programming mm -hmm. or development uh because if we have if in mob programming you take the work and everyone flocks to the work and does the work uh in the other style you split the work to the individuals right but you still have this great ritual of merging it all together it's yeah. like you now are oscillating between working individually and working in a team yeah. where you all have to collaborate on the integration cycle. Why not just be in the team all the time? How about mono programming and poly programming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah multi-threaded, single-threaded. Yeah, right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's where my brain goes. Yeah. Oh, looks like the cat is taking a walk. There you yes. go. But uh, actually, at, at this point about the oscillation of switching modes, mm -hmm. where you go head down on your own, sometimes you know in a tailspin, to try and produce your portion of the work to bring to the team. And then you work as a team to do the integration hmm. just seems weirder than what yeah. if you just worked as a team the whole time. Yeah. And there's so much wasted time that is spent during those synchronizations, like the standups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you do yesterday? Uh, yeah. What are you going right. to do today? Mm -hmm. And then, then you have long standups. So then you spend the retrospectives talking about how should we have better standups. So first you waste the time uh, doing the standups. Then you waste more time. Then you're wasting the retrospective time talking about how you can better waste the time in a better way. <laughs> yeah. What if everybody knew what everybody was working on because they all worked on it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Suddenly this weird idea seems like the normal idea and what we've been doing is weird. I would think, though, that in bigger projects where you have multiple silos of work, it could it could pose more of a problem, don't you? What would be some multiple silos? All right, so let's say you're you're working on a project that has a solution that has thirty or forty projects, and you know they have hire one person to work on this one project because it uses a particular language or technology or something, and another person is doing the data, the back end, another person is doing the communications. 
right? I mean, you've got a team of 20 or 30 people. That seems a little bit um, far-reaching for me, no? Yeah, maybe this wouldn't be the best solution for that, but maybe it would be splitting up that problem yeah. in a different way. Yeah, let's come at this from another angle. We kind of recognize that any given mob, any given ensemble is three to five people, right? Yeah, you have a limit. And so there's a cadence of as fast as you can produce code with that team. Even if that team works flawlessly together, they're in their their space, they know what they're doing. They're only going to put out so much code in so much time Mm. as efficiently as they can be. And that could be a lot. A lot of projects could be happily solved that way. But you have a larger project with way, way more milestones that need to be done and you want to have more people working together. I don't think you make the individual mob bigger, but now you get into multiple mobs and you're back to possibly fighting that synchronization problem where every so often those mobs need to come together to synchronize their code. But at least they would be working within their own domain, hopefully, and wouldn't be crossing each other. So there'd be less chances for merge conflicts and things like that. I hope. Yeah. I would hope. I mean, you would, you would, this is where the architect comes into play and we build boundaries to mm. say, here, you know, maybe negotiate the APIs. You might even have a mob of mobs here where one lead from each mob gets together with the other four mobs and they go through the architecture of how they're going to build those interfaces. Middle <laughs> management <Very> mobs. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're getting to, tw- like you said, a 20 to 20, 30 people working on a project. That's a lot of code, like, but, you know, and it's really a speed thing that they want a certain level of deliverables in a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. So you're going to introduce complexity. There's no two ways about it. Like you can't get get 20 people sitting around one keyboard and be productive. There's a threshold there. But I like the multiple groups or multiple mobs or multiple ensembles idea because as, as these five, four or five person units, they can be a lot more productive in their silo than... Mm -hmm. than the four or five individually working. Well, and the the bigger thing is recognize every piece of code is looked at by multiple people, so it tends to be higher quality and produce more rapidly. Yeah. You know, because as as soon as we get into mobs of mobs, we're now back to, well, why don't you just have individual developers and they do the same consolidation? It's because an individual makes more mistakes and a group makes fewer. And some simple rules like those pieces that are shared among all the projects that somebody has to update you know, they Mm -hmm. have to raise their hand and tell everybody, hey, I'm going to be working on this tonight or tomorrow morning. Check all your stuff in by five and then, you know, have it done in a couple hours. And then we can, you know, just prepare. um, What am I trying to say? Try to prevent merge conflicts before they happen. Yeah. Yeah. You would hope. You would hope. Yeah. If you were to have some sort of synchronization in between, you can at least send any of the team members from any of the mobs because they will mm-hmm. have the same knowledge. They should have all the same knowledge. Uh, about their work, at least. Delegates. But just like you have yeah. somebody good at CSS, you might have somebody good at persuading. And so <laughs> that might be the person uh, you want to send into that mob. Possibly. Mob. Interesting. Yeah. It's not just about technology. <laughs> yeah. Well, it never is, right? Like, this is all about how well we work together and how we yeah. come to consensus on things and how different viewpoints make for a better answer when done constructively. Mm. It can be done toxically. Like, what I what I find interesting about this is, like, this will certainly hunt down the toxic people in your group. If you can't yeah. make this mm. team programming work, it's going to show fast. Yeah. It requires people to be humble yeah. and to be curious about other people. Yeah, and to expect understand that they're they're capable, like they all deliver. Mm. Yeah, you have to. If someone has a, an an adverse solution to yours, uh, you have to be more curious about why would you that be a good solution in your opinion? Right. Yeah. Rather than to bash them and be sure that you win that argument. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, don't win the don't win the argument. Write the code bench it right like i'm perfectly willing and i've been in that situation with two really smart people and said all right we're both going to write and we're going to have a bake-off then <laughs> right and we'll yeah. see what we that's get. a fun way yeah it's it's yeah. an approach it has its own problems now we talk about metrics actually we should break for a moment for the yeah. very important messages and we're back Donnet Rocks. I'm Richard Campbell. Let's call Franklin. Hey. Uh, and talking to our friend Ulrika about mob programming for the first time in a long time, but it, it feels more mature now. Like I'm maybe it's just as I'm older. I'm like, duh, yeah, working together better. Mm. We have more tools now. Yeah, to me it feels uh 
it feels like the obvious approach, but it's, mm. it is because I've been doing it for every day for six years. So sure. to me, it feels a bit odd to do it any other way. Uh, like, why would you split up the work and split up, may have more the, risks? The team. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people do pseudo mobbing anyway. The number of times I've seen an organization where each person had a piece of code, but they keep checking in with each other about problems they're having with their code. The problem is that that's an interruption driven yes. way to do it so that other person was focused and working and you pulled them out of that to ask them a CSS question. IDD, like, yeah. Yeah. interruption driven development. That's it. I'm terrible at asking for help when I'm working right. alone. I, I will sit and bang my head against the solution yeah. trying to figure it and out. Just and then I'm spin. Yeah. Um, and that, maybe this thing. Uh, and, and I'll just try was, this thing. Then I'll ask for help. <laughs> yeah, totally. And that's what I saw with pair programming right away. As the other person knows the moment you're spinning. Because mm. yeah. they're there. They've watched it happen. Yeah. Mm. Right. And it, it's that coach effect of, dude, you're spinning. Like, yeah. it's okay. Let's get you out of the spiral. Like, let's rethink the problem and come mm. at it from a different direction. So you no longer have to have the the sort of executive function to go, oh, I'm spinning here, pull yourself out of it and try and find a way. There's somebody there, puts the hand on the shoulder, and it's like, hey. The uh, four most important words a programmer can memorize and use mm -hmm. is, well, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> right? You got to know yeah. when to say that and try something else. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow, indeed. This is normal. I, I, the, the, the remote angle is interesting, too, because I guess our tech's so much better than it was yep. in the past yes. time we were talking about this. Like to just sit in a, a Zoom call or a Teams call with all the faces there mm. and, you know, the code window and handing off control for typing. And then beside that, you've got another window open because you're doing a little searching or checking or going over docs and and a steady stream of conversation about what we're, what we're writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that doesn't even seem weird now. Yeah. And a few years oh. ago, that wouldn't be that easy. The pandemic fixed this. <laughs> really Thank did. Thank you, pandemic. Thank God <laughs> for the pandemic. <laughs> I'm not going to go that far, but I'm just saying like, everybody's rig got better. Yeah, Every, that's true. The, the etiquette of, of online communication evolved. Yeah. Remember when we had the stupid hat period? During the pandemic, when everybody turned on a filter so they had the digital hats on. I never did that. You missed all that? No. <laughs> no. Dude, you missed out. <laughs> I guess. Uh, oh, I either. saw other idiots doing it, but <laughs> oh, I did yeah. not did not partake of that. But it literally was like an in a rapid incubator evolution to emerge etiquettes around uh, around online, which I mean yeah. it speaks to there must be a sort of agreed upon etiquette in mob programming too. Like are you big on the every camera on thing? Uh, no, we don't actually do that. Um, I think one thing that is interesting with the combination of remoting and mob programming is we spend so many hours a day talking to each other right. uh, that we're getting to know each other very well. Yeah, it's um, very personal. And I've, we have onboarded people fully remotely um, and in a way where you sort of, you get to know them personally because while you're working, you sort of, you crack a joke and then you mm -hmm. end up having a mini break talking about something else. Yeah. Um, I, I need a caffeinated beverage now, please. <laughs> yeah. Do you leave on, do you stay on through lunch or do you, do you when do you unplug? Uh, no, we uh, typically uh, have real lunch breaks and have, uh, uh, have other breaks as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we try to make sure to have uh, a break every hour um, yeah. and, and lunch breaks. And I'm an introvert. So for me, being remote and getting a, a lunch by my own yeah, is actually important, uh, is really valuable. Yeah. And you need to get off the screen. You need to get up and you move yeah. around a bit. Uh, Got to feed my cat. Yeah. For example, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of chuckling because uh, Ulrich's cat has jumped into our lap and is showing us its butt. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's brilliant. You're, you're you're keeping it together just fine, Erica. Everything's yeah, good. everything's fine. Yeah. <laughs> a great cat. <laughs> Again, another thing that came out of the online was the pet sessions. Yeah, uh, and good. children, children wandering in. Yep, children yeah. sessions. Uh, I was having a long a talk with a senior executive at Microsoft at one point, and the two little girls came piling into the room. She goes, "I'm really sorry." I'm like, "It's all good. Put yeah. me on speaker. <laughs> Let's chat. You know? yeah. Yeah. Tell us the story. They want to tell you stories. I want to hear them. Let's do it. You know, to spend." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Spend six, seven minutes letting the kids tell about coming home from school, and then they off they go again. Way better answer, <laughs> you know. Everybody's delighted. You talk about you know connecting with folks. So exactly, uh, yeah, yeah. You know the the social aspect of it. We we you know talked about it as being good, but it really is good. I mean, we can't dismiss that as a benefit, um, a small benefit. It's a huge benefit. Yeah. I mean, you have 
people that connect with each other are more happy in general. Well, and, and if they're more happy, then they're going to be more productive and going to want to solve problems. Teams that trust each other are more productive. Yeah. yeah. Because it resolves arguments faster. Mm-hmm. If I trust that you're smart and good at what you do, when you disagree with me, you almost get this, like, I must have done something wrong. Like, what did I miss? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Rather than the defensive, no, you know, yeah. I know I'm right. Yeah. Like that, that trust makes those things fast. Yeah. yeah. And we've also, we've uncovered a couple of techniques that we use when we notice that we have a, uh, I wouldn't say a conflict, but maybe uh, different ideas on how to solve a problem. Yeah. Um, so one thing that we've done is that we've actually split the team up in those cases. Uh, and we get to go and sit by ourselves uh, and maybe draw a bit on a on a PowerPoint or a Miro or something mm-hmm. like that. Draw out your solution, your idea of how we should do this. And then we come together and we present those, uh, those pictures to each other. Nice. Um, because when you are remoting and you don't have the, the whiteboard just next to you, um, it can be a good idea to to be able to just sit by yourself and get get to draw a solution, get to think about the problem on your own, and then, then come back and talk about how should we solve it together. It also resists the loudest voice effect, too, mm-hmm. right? Or the long, you know, I've often had a talker in the group where it's like, hey, if I just agree with you, will you stop talking? Like, you know, so that to, to diffuse that and go, okay, everybody go in your respective corners and draw out your, finish your idea to present back equalizes the fast talker versus the quieter, more contemplative one. Mm. Like yeah. that quiet person, if they gave, had 30 minutes to really round out their idea and then present it with everybody watching, it's going to land better. That's yeah. a great technique. Well, and he, that's the, you know, I've, the amount of moderation I've done over the years is like, how do I make sure the quiet or thoughtful person gets heard? Yeah. And, and to unplug the mob for a bit and let them go and do that and then come back and everybody gets a cycle, yeah. talk through the ideas. That's great. You know, if in this, in another case, you might have three different ways to achieve the same thing. And so rather than, you know, and it could be something relatively simple. So rather than have everybody go through all three of those potential solutions all at once, you you have them split up for, say, an hour. All right. You try it this way. You try it that way. You try it this way. And then we'll come back. Yeah. Bake off. Right. You don't want to spend too much time doing that, but you can. Yeah. Where if you're starting as, as a group, but if you're not starting as a group, then you you don't have those options. No, you might have it. It might have happened privately in each room, and you only find out in integration when people have spent two weeks yeah. on it. Right. right, exactly. To spend a couple of hours spiking it and then bring the code. I mean, mm. three people go off to write that code in different ways. One of them's gonna come back and go, okay, my idea wasn't that good when I actually tried to code it. Like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other two to come back with different approaches, and it's like, okay, well, let's put some instrumentation around this, spin it up. What are we looking at? And I bet you none of them are correct. Like all of them, it's like, hey, the way you did that instrumentation was better than the way I did it. My code may be fast, but you measure better. Like let's borrow from each other and you get mm-hmm. a better result. I just think about how people feel at the end of the day after an experience like that. Yeah. It's much more fun. Yeah. You've done something together. Yeah. I feel like I've been at recess all day with my friends in grammar yeah. school, you know. But also heard, also <laughs> yeah. took it out for a spin, also yeah. got mm. affirmed. Like yeah. that's pretty cool. And yeah. I never thought of it that way. We're not doing it that way, but that was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that seems yeah. very positive. Oh, so many positive elements to this versus <laughs> this, what also, I now, you know, this oscillation between working independently and trying to integrate. We're also touching on, on the thing that people are going to be noticing if they try out mob programming. They are going to be noticing personal conflicts in a way that you did, didn't have before. All right. Because you used to, maybe if you had a different opinions in a meeting, you would speak split up and then go to different desks. Right. But here you're sort of, you get stuck in that, those different opinions. You're stuck in that moment of, oh boy. okay, we're not agreeing. We have to solve this. And to you're going to be not, stuck in that you're not until let you it solve faster, it. Right. Yeah. Like, different so maybe you will types. notice that your retrospectives might be a, a bit less about how do we have a faster stand up and more of, okay, so how should we handle uh, when we have different opinions, what should we do? It's not just that, but personality type clashes. Yes. Like if you're not emotionally intelligent enough to realize that, oh, that person is the direct opposite of me on the 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 Carl Jung spectrum or the um, Myers-Briggs scale or whatever you want to use, 
uh, and you're not smart enough to know that, all right, well, you know what well, I, I have to read past the body language and all of that other stuff that I'm taking in as information and just get to what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That can be tough. Yeah. So I think you will grow as a person in that sense because you will have to, to learn about other people's personalities sure. uh, a bit more and maybe dare to say, I feel uncomfortable uh, when you're interrupting me. Uh, mm. C- can I please speak? Uh, things like that that yeah. might come up to the surface in a way that wouldn't come up to the surface when you don't have to stick in the moment. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I keep thinking back to who was the politician that said, "Can I finish?" Mm-hmm. Ross Perot. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> can I finish? Can I yeah. finish? But you know, I think, and you also will have refereeing type personalities in there. It's like, wait. Let's hear this out. Yeah. I, I mean, it gets challenging when you get into a situation where we disagree on this. Somebody wants to spike the code. And the other one's like, I, why? We don't need to do this. Mm. Okay, let's get moving on. Right? It's it's different people at different pacing. So, but yeah. I think it, it might, it speaks. Now I'm thinking in terms of it has to be an uneven number. So you don't end up with a perfect mm. split on any position. Yeah. It does help yeah. to, to have that. <laughs> yeah. Three or five, four yeah. would be problematic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because you you will have that schism, so yeah, better to have it sp- an uneven split, so that at least you can get a sense of well, the majority disagrees with you. Although hopefully they do that in kindness. Then there's got to be a lot of kindness in this. If you're going to be successful. It speaks mm-hmm. to a certain set of personalities. Yes, indeed. Um, challenges besides the things that we've talked about. I'm um, obviously I've, I've brought up um, pushback potential. You know, if you things that you need to be uh, uh, kind of understand before you pitch this kind of thing. But, but what are some challenges or, or potential pitfalls that people could fall into that we haven't already talked about? Mm, I find a, uh, a typical one that I've heard is when people go, uh, this work is not suitable for mob programming. Interesting. Uh, well, yeah. What would so that you're, be? you're doing a lot of mob work and then, things get difficult. Maybe it's a bug that you're supposed to troubleshoot and mm. you're a bit stressed out. Um, and mm-hmm. then it gets, a, it gets difficult. And then your instinct will be to retract from the difficult moment. Mm-hmm. And so people have lots of opinions on, uh, this work is not suitable for, for mobbing. Um, and I think, is there work that's not suitable for mobbing? Possibly if you're doing something very repetitive, like putting, uh, changing all the lines in a 250 row file, <laughs> maybe right. something like that. That just means that the rest of the mob is bored. The typer yeah. is typing as fast as they can, as opposed yeah. to like, if you, if you've got three people who cannot agree on something, that seems very mobbable because otherwise you would have found out the disagreement after the code was already written. Hmm. Yeah. But I think situations where you are typically troubleshooting situations are a bit more difficult. Interesting. Um, so what typically ends up, and this is so funny, uh, uh, had a, a colleague who was a, a senior developer. Like we, we all looked up to him and he had really good solutions every time. And at one point in time, someone asks him like, okay, so in your opinion, what makes a senior developer? And his answer was someone who reads the error messages. <laughs> that's a good one yeah, yeah. i was Re- like surely that can't like that can't be the level that we're holding people at but if you look around uh people are not reading error messages mm-hmm. often a problem mm-hmm. yeah and so if you do that in a mob situation where no one actually reads the actual message and everyone goes like oh i know what this is yeah um yeah. and people have different ideas on what this is is um and that you're a seems, bit stressed because this like is a, a production thing, error. Right? Like you let somebody, you let the person on the keyboard run with their immediate instincts. But my off the keyboard, I would want a copy of that error message and looking it up. And somebody yeah. else mm-hmm. is searching through logs saying how often it's happened. Like debugging as a group seems really powerful. But it is, but it's hard when you are a bit stressed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can see another challenge would be people who think slower than other people. Mm-hmm. So take my wife and I playing a game, for example. She can figure out, we play a logic game, right? And she figures stuff out way before I do because I'm a programmer, right? I'm methodical. All right, apply this rule, eliminate these <laughs> possibilities, apply that rule. And she's like, it's there, you idiot. <laughs> you know? So, But mixing, yeah. in, mixing intuitive and logical processing 
often builds great results. Yeah. You know, as long as everyone's got a little patience for each other. I'm, yeah, I'm coming it. at this from an administrator's perspective where we've been firefighting it, four of us firefighting an outage, often remote, you know, with an IRC channel open, which ends up being a record of us actually diagnosing the problem. Like, and the joke is every time it's like, hey, it was a six hour outage. It took us one hour to detect it, four hours to diagnose it, and 15 minutes to implement the fix and get it <laughs> up and running again, and then another hour to write it up. <sighs> but everything is about diagnostics. Uh, but having multiple eyes on logs and searches and so forth made a huge difference for us. I never thought of it as mobbing, you know, we, because we weren't actually creating anything. We were just trying to put out a fire. Yeah. Mm. But, you know, the big rule we repeating to ourselves is like, don't make the hole deeper. Yeah. <laughs> if you're going to make a change, you know what change you've made and how to revert it. So, yeah. you know, often we get it back up, but we've mangled six things trying to get it back up because we didn't actually fully diagnose the problem. Mm. And I think that's one of the situations where people, uh, where it's common that people sometimes do, if you do more programming from time to time, mm-hmm. uh, they can, the teams can go, okay, so this is really important to get right. Let's do this thing together. Or right. this is an actual outage. Let's do that together. Um but but maybe not, then not revert to it when it comes to to normal work. That's interesting to have, do periodic mod programming with a team, maybe as a transition from the old, from traditional styles. I think a common one, which is pretty good, is uh, onboarding new team members. Right. Hmm. Uh, that's a good place to start if you're looking Throw them to them in the mob. Like, yeah. Throw them in the mob. <laughs> help them big up, build out their configuration, and get to check inable code. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Always my threshold for how many days after we hire someone can they are they capable of checking in code? Yeah, it's not about their programming ability; it's about understanding the infrastructure well enough to have gotten to the point where their code can be checked in and pulled into this into the pipeline. But uh, yeah, doing that as a mob would be more fun. But I I love this statement you said like this code's too important to do individually, so we'll do it as a group. It's like isn't all code that important? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that as soon as idea. you can say that, then it's like, oh, this code is stupid. Let one person work on it. Mm. Do you transcribe these sessions and refer back to those transcripts when you have issues? Um, no, we haven't done that. Uh, we can sometimes try to summarize it because you know, it's mm. good to know what, why did this actually happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but we haven't had any transcription so far. Mm-hmm. Although, let's face it, with the new LLM technology and things, transcription's gotten way easier. It's transcription and yeah. summarization. Yeah. You know, if you're paying Definitely. for the premium version of Teams, that comes in the box now with, with Copilot, with uh, M3CTI Copilot. Mm. Yeah. That every, imagine every, you know, six, seven hour programming session at the end of it. You get an e- everybody gets an email saying, this is what you did today. Hmm. I don't know how high quality that would be, but that's the tools we have now. Like it speaks to the uh, whole other elevation. Mm-hmm. Yep. Interesting. Yep. Like this sure this may actually be getting easier. Yeah. All right. So um, have we left any stone unturned? Is there anything <laughs> else that you want to talk about? Um, no, I think, I think we've, the most important thing for me is how how I feel that like while we're doing knowledge work, mm-hmm. I think that's what we should optimize for. Mm. Uh, and, and knowledge work is about is about knowledge sharing um, and learning new things and helping each other grow and learning from each other. So I think I think mob programming is is the best fit for that. Um, and to me, it feels like it should be the normal, yeah, the normal way of working in a team. And then there could be situations where it, you could go for individual. Uh, mm-hmm. solo work uh, in certain situations perhaps but i think the, the normal should be uh working as a team mm-hmm. mm. great stuff so th- are there resources you point people to for this Ulrika? uh i would say woody Zool's book mm-hmm. uh software teaming uh would be a, a good a good place yeah okay what's next for you what's in your inbox uh oh we are going to be uh, continuing on event sourcing. So I was listening to your uh, last episode just oh, today. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's going to be fun. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Good. Well, thank you for uh, bringing this topic back to .NET Rocks. It's been great and it's good to hear that uh, you're being successful with it. And I hope some of our listeners are also thinking about doing this. It's good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And we'll talk to you next time on .NET Rocks.
Net Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a 